Hey guys, I'm excited to be back and put up a video. We're behind, but Scrappy's been flying. It's awesome. I'm super excited. If you saw a past video, there's some things I wanted to upgrade on Scrappy. One of which was Scrappy is flying so much slower than I anticipated, which is unbelievable. And this reshaping wing allows me to land really flat and really slow rather than so high that I hooked my tail and dropped. So uh, I couldn't be happier with the results, but that meant I want a little more aileron control. It feels similar to most Cubs I've flown at really, really slow speeds, but I want a little more margin of safety. So we're gonna add cord to my aileron, length to my aileron, and since I don't want heavy input pressures, by adding cord, it would get heavier in the stick. So I'm gonna add a horn to the front that counteracts that the air hooks when I go up and helps assist and when, the, and when it goes down, it hooks and helps assist. Basically, I'm adding power steering to Scrappy because I'm making a larger aileron. We're making larger flaps. And a lot of asked if I could do a little bit more on tips and tricks of making cheap one-off little parts. If you wanted to make a carbon fiber part and have never done it before, what's the cheapest way? How much would it cost? I'll throw up the materials I use. We'll make a quick part. I'm gonna put in some gap seals out of carbon fiber on Scrappy. I hope you guys like this video. We have a lot more coming. I love you guys. You know the drill. Back to work. It's physics, math, and engineering. Machine it, draft it, build it, test it, break it. Every time something new gets built, the entire world advances. Laying in bed at night, it's designing new parts, designing new suspension, designing new wings. All right, we're getting closer. I went ahead and decided to extend my flaps at the same time as my aileron. So this is the new little teeny baby rib we've made and I've actually got them all installed. So if you look right now, this double slotted used to end right there. So this is the extension. Now, a lot of flaps, they just have one push bar that pushes the flap down. And if I only had one, I couldn't just extend this. But since on Scrappy, I did a torque tube that runs the entire length of the wing, I added multiple push rods that push the flaps. So what's great, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> but on Scrappy, fortunately I had multiple push rods that push the flap. So I've got all the structural loads I need to handle the extra forces. And it's pushing at this point and about a third in from the other point. Pulling this apart was actually really easy. It took several hours. We just had to drill it all out. And then I cut the original skin back. I didn't want to just add on. I would have been adding weight by just extending the old one. And the angle of the pinch on a short one was different. I had to open it up to get it to go longer and I wanted it to be aerodynamically correct. So I didn't just wanna slap on a piece of metal to the back. It wouldn't have been the right way to do it. You could you'd just add weight and it wouldn't be aerodynamically perfect. You'd have, it, have a double step in it. We made new ribs. Now I went ahead and I didn't take out the rivets here on the bent front part of this because since it's already together and normally the skins overlap like this, I thought it'd be nice to leave this little trim at this line and be able to put two skins butt together and not have a step, just make it a little aerodynamically cleaner. When I designed this skin in the computer, we designed it with a little teeny one degree kink where it meets down this line, the whole edge, we just kink it one degree. And then when you put it on here and you rivet it, the rivet is right on the kink line and it pushes and it puts pressure on that metal to stay tucked down and under so that there's no point that it could lift. This is done, we gotta get the ailerons done. Huh. Man, I tell you what, I can't leave things alone. <laughs> I wanted to make bigger ailerons, now bigger flaps. Where was it, where is it gonna stop? I need to go play. You got a problem. Yeah. All right, I've just got the skins done. Since we drew it all on the computer, it was nice because we could put in every single rivet hole to line up with the new ribs and my ailerons and flaps. And you can see I've got two bends on here. This is the kink line I was talking about. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but it's just a one degree bend. This side, you can actually see a four degree bend. This is where the two sheet metals come down the aileron and the flap and they meet together. I just got a little bend going opposing directions when I pinch it. It makes a flat surface. And then this little shim, it's not needed. I don't really see it on many aircraft. This is going to go between where the two metals come together of the two skins of the ailerons and flaps 
and have the little bend coming out. It's going right between those two, so when I pinch it, it makes that trailing edge really strong. It allowed me to go one gauge thinner on the skin of the aileron and flap and get the strength at the edge where the two rivet together by just adding that little teeny piece. And though this added weight, I was able to eliminate almost 10 times the amount of weight by going one thinner and still have the strength I want at the back of the aileron and flap. So, ah, that's fucking patchwork. Here is the new aileron rib to get the three inches longer. So that's now been installed and I've got the lower skin on. And so to see kind of this trim piece I was talking about, this is going right there to thicken up just the trailing edge. And then this is the top skin that's got the reverse bend on it. So I got to drill a bunch of holes, zillion clean coats. It's going really fast. About to work. Okay guys, we're gonna do something a little different in this video. A lot of people have asked, how can I make a carbon fiber part as cheap as possible if I only wanna make one of them? School's in session. In mass production carbon fiber, you might end up spending thousands of dollars to custom machine a billet chunk of aluminum or a composite fiberglass resin based mold and then vacuum bag to it. That makes the strongest mass produced carbon fiber part you can build. But not everyone wants to build 500 pieces. So we're gonna make a couple parts I need for Scrappy to fill in gaps uh, that I didn't have time to do before Oshkosh, but it's a filler gap on my flaps, my double slotted Keller Fowler flaps from Airframes Alaska, which I absolutely love. So thank you guys for making such a cool product. I set the flaps up to hold it away from the fuselage because I didn't know how I was gonna trim the window how the taper would be, and I wanted to make a filler piece to close the gap between the edge of the flap and the side of the fuselage. So I need to make some really crazy shapes. So let's get started and kind of give you an idea of the cost. So if I was gonna have a company make the part, I'd end up spending close to $2,000, even if I could find someone willing to do it. We wanna build something for a couple hundred bucks. Here we have carbon fiber. This right here with the resin, you can just get it from all kinds of carbon fiber places. I like a nice uh, light thin weave like this, makes it easy to fold around some crazy shapes I'm doing. But if you kind of budget in your mind, a given yard of carbon fiber per yard with the resin, two part resin, the plastic you throw away, a little bit of waste, I factor about $50 all in. Now you'll find it for half that price for the carbon, but. Uh, per yard, $50 a yard all in. But if you wanna just mentally go, what does it cost for resin, carbon, plastic, everything you need, $50 a yard will get you really close. Okay, this is how I'm gonna make the mold rather than out of composites, fiberglass, or aluminum. House insulation foam. This sheet, enough to do what I'm gonna make today, was about 18 bucks. Probably two yards of carbon fiber all in. We'll factor $100 there, including all waste plastic, cutters, scissors, I just throw away, dollar a piece scissors, you just throw away when you're done. And then the most important part is get on SolidWorks. They have some programs out there. I think you can get a trial offer or you can find someone to draw you up some parts. Uh, we draw them up here. This took about, I don't know, half hour to an hour to quickly kind of draw out what it, we needed to get the shapes we wanted. I found a local shop who water jetted this just for a few bucks. It only took them about 15 minutes to water jet these for me. So 
you're not gonna have a lot of cost to have someone water jet it. And rather than making a really expensive mold, I needed these two crazy shapes. This is my flap on Scrappy. They move out and they come apart like this to separate and then tuck back in each other. I wanna make an extension to that out of carbon fiber. I need it about four inches deep. It's actually about three and a half. So to do that, I actually cut two pieces of foam. What we're gonna do is just wrap carbon fiber around these and then use the actual block we cut out of and then shove these in. And the thickness of the cut of the water jet is enough to make a, such a tight fit that when I shove the carbon fiber around this part and it squishes all, almost all the resin out, I'll use two together. I'm gonna first spray glue these together so they act as one giant block that makes the bigger part I need. And then we'll shove them through our pre-made mold. We'll let it dry and we'll just bust the foam off of it and throw it away. That's the cheapest way I know of to make a quick, easy part out of carbon fiber. Probably take us an hour from right now, start to finish, to finish the product, set it aside. It's gonna be a chemical cure. So we're using a two-part chemical cure rather than a heat cure. It can dry without any oven. It's something you can do in your own garage at home. So let's wrap some carbon, base this up, put this together. You'll see a part in about an hour to get it done. We'll let it dry for the day. Tomorrow we'll rip it apart, sand it up and install it. Back to work. All right, it looks perfectly aligned, but if I run my finger in there, I can probably fill a 10 thousandths of an inch light little step in there. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do real quick, just because whatever's in here is gonna show up on the part, I'm gonna just take a little bit of sandpaper and lightly sand that 10 thousandths of an inch step. When I push the carbon fiber in, it's gonna smooth all up. So a little bit of sanding, back to work. All right, another little trick on our one-time throwaway mold. We've sanded out the inside, got it all cleaned up. Now, water jet makes a little scoring, and we don't want to have to sand all the resin that will go into the little scoring marks of that cut. And so, just get some basic wax, auto wax, and you can just smear it in, and you can see where I've just started to do it. And it just fills in those cracks, but I'm doing it on the inside of this mold, which will be the part we break off and it helps fill the voids and it just makes less sanding and a smoother finish. It isn't a wax so much about the release because the foam we're just breaking off, but when we break it off, we don't want those little ridges from the water jet left over and just more work to sand. So a little wax right now, save us 20 minutes later. Back to work. got this all wrapped up a couple things you might have noticed on the time lapse or close up along the way 
I did put this all down on a piece of plastic. I made sure the plastic had no wrinkles where this part was gonna hit the bottom. That's so the back side of the part or the visible side of the part is perfectly smooth, has a nice release to pull from. And as I push these in, I made sure I wrap the carbon fiber around the foam, thinking about that it's gonna be trying to stretch or pull the carbon fiber off. If you just kind of went any direction and then went to push it in here, the pink would go in and all the carbon fiber would just bulge out of it. So you need to make sure that it's a full wrap. It pulls it tighter and tighter against the pink foam as it goes in and makes a really tight finish. Also, you may have noticed along the way that the resin was squishing out because the tolerance for the carbon fiber versus the gap from the water jet is actually creates a squeeze. That's so that since we don't have a vacuum bag or an oven, an autoclave where you do vacuum and pressure, this is just a mechanical pressure squeeze to get the resin out. Um, we wanted to make sure it was tight tolerance and the foam just pushes out of the way, but the squeeze allows the resin to back into the foam. Anyway, all in, we're a couple hours total all into this part. We're gonna let it cure for a couple hours, get back to work on other little projects, then we'll pull it apart and sand it. But I think for a one-off part, AB reverse molds, complex shape, we're gonna be into this maybe 200 bucks. I have a whole bunch of different methods of doing different carbon fiber with autoclaves, vacuum bags, um, more complex shapes on past videos, but I hope this helped. You can do it yourself. It can be done cheap. It can be done without a vacuum bag. Here's just one way. Hope you liked it. Let's get back to work. All right, guys, I'm gonna quickly throw up on the screen um, the resin I use AB two part to do this where you don't need to use an oven. It chemically cures it. You got different speeds, slow, medium, and fast. It depends on how long and how big the part and how much time you need to work with it. I'm not promoting one brand over another. There's a lot of great brands out there. It just happens to be what I use. I'm not sponsored by any carbon company or anything, so. Not yet. Here's what I use. I hope it helps. Let's go ahead and uh, tell you a little bit about what these gap seals are for and how big a gap sh seal should be. It varies on all aircraft and they range anywhere from almost touching and even on bigger aircraft, you'll see big half inch gaps. A lot of it has to do with the bigger the aircraft, the more expansion contraction you'll have in some of the components. You need to make sure that those components can never get to a point where one will grow if half of a wing was in the shade and another uh, wasn't or the back half caused a flap to grow. They could grow and make contact. The bigger the part, the larger the gap, but ultimately you want it as small as possible. However, there is a point when it becomes too small and that has to do with icing conditions. On my race planes, <laughs> on my race planes, I tightened up the gaps between my flaps and any end part or my ailerons and the side edges of the ailerons. I tightened them up as tight as about an eighth of an inch. Now that's as tight as I wanna go. The tighter the gap, the better the airflow, the less transfer from high to low pressure trading places between the gaps. So your wing's more efficient, it's faster, but it's also riskier. The risk comes in if you're going through icing conditions. There have been a lot of fatalities caused by this. So be careful on how big your gap is between any moving components. That includes your elevator, rudder, aileron, and flaps. What happens is, is the cold ice hits the wing, it, and if you're in a composite wing, sometimes the ice doesn't flash as fast as it would on a metal wing when it tends to hit and freeze quickly. But that water will roll back on all styles of wings, and it comes back and then it starts to drip down in between some of the gaps. And if you're in clear, smooth air, it becomes really risky. 
because you don't have a lot of movement on your controls and your autopilot's running everything. And they've had fatalities where people get what's called ice bridging between moving components. The smaller the gap, the quicker you can get ice down between them and literally fill a gap if it was only an eighth eight of an inch thick, completely solid with ice. And then all of a sudden you go to turn the plane or the autopilot kicks off because it's not strong enough to do it. You grab the stick and you have no movement in any direction. It's been more common on elevators and they've perfected it over time. But just keep in mind if you're building your own aircraft, don't get too tight. On Scrappy, I'm running a quarter inch gap. I'm less worried about extremely fast. I just wanna make sure I got lots of movement, weeds, brush, who knows what I might throw up. I don't want anything to bind up in any of those tolerances. On Scrappy, that's what I'm gonna use, a quarter inch. I would never go tighter than an eighth. I actually don't even like saying that. That's pretty tight. But on my race planes, especially, if that's the right word, especially. Oh, you were right the first time I did. Uh, if I was racing, I might even take a gap that's as tight as an eighth of an inch on a race plane and put a temporary folded piece of plastic that was glued on one side that could touch the other control surface and it could flip flop and drag along it to stop the air from moving. And that was to make sure there was no air passing through it, but I would never fly where I could get any ice or any altitude with that. When I was done with the race, I'd pull them off. It's the same reason you see guys putting tape and actually taping off their flaps and not even using flaps just to stop that little bit of air from sneaking through. Anyway, I hope that helps when you're building your airplane, setting your gaps. Be careful, be safe, have fun, share the love of aviation. You guys know the drill. I'm going back to work.